Venue IQ, the award-winning UK-based event platform, are proud to partner this podcast series. We really hope you enjoy it. And when you're done, head over to venu-iq.com to find out all about our on-demand event builder service, featuring fully branded native apps and hybrid web platforms created in as little as 24 hours. We believe in live events and getting your audience to the most important content, sponsors, exhibitors and opportunities as quickly and as easy as possible. We don't believe in gimmicks, so you won't find any avatars or digital buildings anywhere in sight. Venue IQ had already won awards for best conference technology and best use of AI. And that was before we added registration, live streaming, one-to-one video meetings, video breakout sessions and much, much more. Simple, transparent pricing that won't blow your budget from a UK-based team who really care. At Venue IQ, we work to ensure your event, whether live, virtual or both, can be a monumental success in this brave new world. That's venu-iq.com. Enjoy the podcast. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever and whenever you are tuning into today's podcast. I am joined today by Anna abdul who is from a new organization called Isla. Anna, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. No problem. Before we get into Isla, Anna, um, I do this with every guest. I, I just want people to understand what the background is, where, what brought you to where you are today. So could you give us a brief history of, of your, your career, your experiences with, within the events industry? Yeah. Um, so my background is as a freelance event producer, which is a really bad time currently to be a freelance event producer. Um, but I've worked freelance for the last sort of four or five years with quite a number of um, UK agencies, working on some really big um, events with global brands and so on. Um, and I love I love events. I love getting on site, seeing them come together. I mostly love seeing them come down, to be honest, because it's such a feeling of satisfaction. But um, my where Isla has come from as a, a project I worked on um, last year that was going completely against a lot of my personal ethics, just in terms of how I was purchasing certain things and what was happening with those um, kind of onward at the end of that event. Yeah. And I just started having conversations with a few people um, and a few ideas sprung up. And that is where that's a very, very, very loose introduction to what Isla is. I don't know if you're going to ask me. Another yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. And so, on, but. so I have down here, and I think this is a really good explanation, that Isla is a non-profit. And I think that's, re- let's stress that it's a non-profit industry organization supporting the events industry transition to a sustainable future through action and measurable practice. Now, sustainability is something that I'd I'd be I hesitate I hesitate here, but if anybody's not conscious of it, wants to see a more sustainable future for for our industry, for the world, for their children, for you know for themselves, then I'd really question where the mind is. But this is something I know at Event Industry News we're very passionate about. We, we've launched some of our own programs um, at the back end of of, of well, the beginning, should I say, of of this year, um, and I think it's it's now that it's right on everybody everybody's priority list maybe a little slightly pre-corona let's be honest about it um but you know if we are now is the time to change right now is the time to start measuring and taking action and stop talking about it in in certain groups so that's the way that we've described it i guess between us prior to this this podcast and i think that really gives people a sense of of what the um what the organization's about i think more importantly um there are 12 members already to this organization. So could you, could you explain a little bit more about those, those organizations? Yeah, so we have, so Isla has 12 founding member agencies. Um, and the story around that is, um, like I say, following on from last year when I was working on this event and started having conversations, uh, it, there was clearly um, a huge appetite for more support for the industry and more solutions for the industry. Um, And so I started having conversations with a few agencies I'd worked for previously um, around what we could do in getting together and having a conversation about this and essentially uh, recognizing that sustainability is not a competitive element. It shouldn't be a competitive Mm. element. It should be a collaborative solution in the same way that health and safety is not competitive. Um, You know, health and safety is something that goes onto a budget. It's something that we have to do. Um, and you know that's not how you sell your event essentially and that we shouldn't be treating sustainability as something competitive there should be basic standards that we're all working towards and you can go above and beyond those um 
anyway, so the conversation with a few of these agencies, there were four right at the beginning. Um, they, we all agreed to sit down and we kind of started studying the message and seeing who else we could get on board. Um, and we sat down in November, uh, sorry, December 2019 um, as a group of 15 agencies at the time to talk about collaboration over competition. Um, and from that meeting, some of the proposals kind of that were put forward and discussed was that actually a representative body that focuses solely on sustainability for the industry that helps support the industry, provides best practice, guidance, helps us measure, um, that is independent of any one organization. And that's where the concept of the membership came from, where they found yep. members rather than um, just founders. All spread from, and so over the last kind of... Um, uh, last year essentially from january we kind of started getting this in, into place setting it up understanding what it would look like to be a member what kind of engagement would be necessary from people what we could do as an organization and so on um and that's where it's all grown from so um our 12 founding members uh have it, it's because of coronavirus it went from 15 to 12 unfortunately just yep. circumstantially i think as everyone can understand um but still 12 brilliant agencies um you can head to our website to take a look at who our founding members are rather than listing them all out now yeah um, that's a good yeah. show <laughs> <laughs> yeah so that's really um that really the, the focus of that was to kind of solidify that idea of collaborating rather than competing um can i just say yeah. can i just say um, and sorry to interrupt you, uh, congratulations and well done for, and I'm going to use this word, corralling 12 agencies or 12 <laughs> founding members together. Because let's be honest, we, we live in a competitive world, the events industry, we, we touch every sector around the world, we support every industry. And, you know, there are lots of agencies out there, and, and I'm sure more than the 12 that you've got as members now. But, there is, you know, there are a big... Uh, there are a, a proportion of big agencies that do a lot and, and it is a competitive world and, and most of the time everybody gets on you know nicely but let's be honest about coming together on a, on a specific project that's no mean feat getting everybody talking and, and agreeing on certain certain things and it's absolutely been needed because unless we work together we're all kind of going off and doing our own thing right yeah and I think that's the thing like, it was definitely a process working with lots of people who are normally competitors but I think mm. one of the things that has been really incredible is like the willingness for everybody to get on you know it has been um you know there's lots of things that have come up but that's more around the opera operations and organization of how something like this would work much more than kind of you, you wouldn't have thought that they were necessarily competitors sitting around the table you know yeah. everybody was yeah. really um willing and engaged and I think that speaks volumes in itself that actually we have got 12 agencies come together and this was pre-coronavirus, pre-sort of trying to save the industry. So it kind of was one of the first times that sort of thing had ever happened. And that was yeah. recognised in the meetings. And I think everybody felt quite motivated by that in itself, um, that there was that willingness to engage and have that conversation. Well, interestingly, we, we talked about com we, we've talked about competitiveness in a sustainability podcast. That, that's an interesting one. But actually, some, in some way to me, it kind of makes things fairer because it, it makes it more uh, everybody's competing on the same level when it comes to sustainability because I have seen some bad practice maybe in the past where people have been marketing sustainability as a marketing tool as a, as a marketing yeah. message or using sustainability should I say as a marketing message to try and be more competitive or, or to try and attract a specific audience now if all of these agencies and, and all of these members going forward will all be measuring and being accountable in the same way then that kind of evens that level playing field doesn't yeah. it around that and, and actually moves it more about being sustainable rather than having a marketing cue yeah. I, I don't know that's just my opinion I, don't, I think you're right I think really there's a lot of greenwashing that happens with regards to sustainability globally it's not just you know in the event sector um, but I also think that greenwashing um, there's kind of malignant greenwashing and then mm -hmm. there's greenwashing because actually we don't know any better um, and so statements might be made or kind of assertions put forward or proposals put forward as part of a pitch or as part of, you know, a sustainability plan that are absolute best intentions. You know, they're genuinely coming from a place of wanting to do better. Um, and, you know, I think it is important to raise that point because with sustainability, particularly as an event producer, 
um, and also as a supplier, you're almost expected to be an expert. You know, your client, mm. whether you're, it's a brand that is your client or whether you, uh, whether your client is an agency because you're a production company or cater or so on, you know, they want you to propose sustainable solutions or what's better, this or this, or like, how can we be more green? And actually we're not experts in that. You know, you're, we're experts in logistics or, uh, you know, set building or, technology or something um, and yeah. so having to answer a lot of those questions and deal with that is you know a really challenging activity um and so i think sorry this kind of segues into one of the things but one of our um key resources that we offer at isla is training and that training is around um is around how you manage sustainability and mm -hmm. how you look at setting sustainability kpis or how you look at um embedding sustainability into your project planning but a big part of that is being able to recognize what can we do what can i do what knowledge do i have and experience do i have and what common sense can i employ but also to what point does that do i need help to what point if the client is asking for us to do x y and z are we able to do x and y but we need support with z for example and therefore mm -hmm. Because a lot of the time as well, it comes into, you know, a budget question. Um, sustainability is intrinsically linked to our budget. You know, the more budget we've got, the more we're able to put sustainability into the picture. But there's so many different things that you can do that aren't dependent on budget, just in terms of the way that you design and plan your event, right? Yeah. Um, but I think if you're able to identify the areas where you know that you're going to need to spend extra budget because you recognize you need support from an external consultant, for example, or you need to get a specialist waste management supplier or those sorts of things, you can start building that in and actually having like um, real conversations with a client and not kind of best guessing. Um, so that's one of the things uh, around kind of sustainability statements that links all back to greenwashing is uh, and kind of making it a competitive issue is that, that those things aren't, in, they're not bad, you know, you're not bad, we're not bad people for trying to do better um yeah. we don't have the skills and resources and that's a lot of where isla comes from is is um sorry i keep talking i keep no 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 listen like me not interrupt me blowing it comes out but <laughs> me not interrupting you is a good thing because you you you're explaining really really well anna um and i'm sure what you're saying resonates with many listeners at the moment uh, and probably they're building that situation themselves i want to pick up on one thing that you said right at the, back at the beginning that isla actually came out through your own experiences and and almost being forced down a particular path yeah. was that predominantly budget led then with were, were those non-sustainable ways of producing events more more around cash or was it just a uh, we don't care about that let's move this way i think um so the specific the specific um project that pushed me kind of down this path was I was working as a graphics producer mm -hmm. um, and you know anyone who works in graphics knows you buy all kinds of terrible materials you know yeah we're moving slowly away from Fomex but that's only with big brands that have made big statements it's about Fomex actually how yeah. much Fomex are we buying how much kind of polyester stretch fabric are we buying all those sorts of things and I was working on a project where I was buying an unbelievable volume of polyester fabric for printing um and it was there was no plan for where it was going um it wasn't it wasn't a consideration and it's almost fine that it wasn't a consideration because it's not a an element that we think about as being a sustainability issue necessarily you know there might be a, a few people on the whole that recognize that printing loads of stuff on Fomex and and polyester and vinyl and all that kind of thing are sustainability pinch points and challenges but mm -hmm. It's not like flights and it's not like food waste that are really obvious things that you might be able to do something about. Yep. Um, and it was, I, I spent a lot of time trying to find solutions for what I could do with this fabric. And um, it came to this place like, there's nowhere for me to turn. Where do I go to? Mm -hmm. Who do I talk mm -hmm. to? You know, I can't actually talk to my peers because, again, they're not experts. Why should they know what to do with this? Um, and we're not fashion, so we don't have, you know, loads of supports in the fashion industry where you could, might have recycling, textile recycling programs, all that kind of thing. So there was a there was a big thing of it, like there's a massive resource gap. Um, and my life would be much easier if I had somewhere to turn to that yeah. might be able to support me, understand what I could do better. But then I kind of took a step back from that, which was a bit like, well, actually, wouldn't it be amazing if we designed this event slightly differently in the first place where we didn't need to use all this fabric? And so it just kind of kick-started that 
that perspective of, of how are we designing things you know we we talk about the circular economy and the circular economy has become you know really focal in sustainability conversations um but how do we actually make that happen for events um, mm-hmm. and what does that actually mean because the circular economy you know as a concept nice idea but it's totally impractical in a, in a lot of ways but that's because we think so linearly you know yeah. partly because we're humans we don't have circular lifestyles we're you know <laughs> you're born and you die and so that's kind of how we process the world something you know you buy and then you burn yeah 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 absolutely it's 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 threaded through our lives in its entirety isn't it? even down to tech tech has a has a lifespan mm. um interestingly i was reading i was watching something yesterday about them being able to now produce or moving towards producing a battery that's got the, the uh, a half-life of something like thirty-five thousand years and that's the future of where technology can, can help but in the in the in the event sphere i guess we we build and break things in the moment right you, we, we can't you know we, we're not like construction where we can go okay this building is going to be here for a hundred years so let's make all this heavy investment really early on and that will pay off much much later on and for, for much much longer we're driven by we've got an event for three days or a week or whatever and we need to this is going to sound really derogatory but we need to make it look pretty and it doesn't really matter how we make it look pretty as long as we can make it look because it's about how we make people feel in events yeah. um and on the whole most consumers who are experiencing those events are not it's not very transparent between how that event was produced or what the materials and and people are probably not thinking about it when they come to attend as well so it's not like um it's not like fashion like you mentioned earlier where it's very visible in terms of you know the manufacturing process and the the recycling process and the sustainability process around those Uh, the events industry is kind of hidden in terms of its processes and its manufacturing and the way it's put together right i've been talking Um, about this for so long about the event industry being a hidden sector um and I think so much that becomes apparent with how, I mean, that's a completely different topic, but how we yep. have the left behind in COVID that, you know, everything going on with that, but absolutely a space for that, but that's, <laughs> it's a hidden industry. So, um, and, and that's one of the things that I have talked about and kind of one of the things that I think is quite um, something to consider is that, I mean, IR35 is almost totally forgotten now, you know, but last year IR35 was just causing so much hassle for people. Um, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of one of those things where I was sort of seeing sustainability. Sustainability at some point is going to be legislated. There's going to be performance markers for for different industries and different people, different organisations. And it's kind of one of those things of watching everybody kind of scrabble around to see how they respond to deal with IR35 that was going to have the least impact on their business. It was kind of the same, kind of that thinking was a bit like, well, let's just get ahead let's do what we can so when sustainability becomes legislation in in whatever way that is either on reporting your waste or you know working towards both national targets or so on like we can we're already doing that you, know? you make, make an interesting point and this would be something i'd be totally up for if we got taxed as, as corporations being on based on how sustainable we were i bet you watch how quick the world changes yeah at that point. Right, like you know, if you pay tax, that is. If you pay tax, that is. <laughs> All those offshore companies that are in on, on the British Virgin Islands not paying anything. This is for you. No, it, it's it's interesting, isn't it? Though, because you know, look at what's happening at the moment. We're we're, we're still pre-pandemic. Or well, sorry, pre-pandemic. We're still in the pandemic. On the first of September, we're recording this now, and you know, there's already talk of corporation tax going up four percent, and everybody in the world's kicking off about it in the UK because it's like, well, hold on a second, four four percent more. We're we're struggling here. Four percent, not zero. We're paying. <laughs> but it, yeah, but it should. But but I do think you know. I, I think you're absolutely right. I think it will be legislated. I think it will be part and parcel of uh, you know, just like health and safety is as, as around events. We will have to be because we're 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 burning the resources out of our of, of our world really rapidly and we kind of create this disposable economy around us that's all about the next thing and and that thing lasts for a for a, for a small while i don't want to go off on a tangent here because i was like you know oh, no, it's, it's easy to do though isn't it <laughs> it's it, nothing i think never the word the word true is nothing's built to last like it used to be kind of thing everything's disposable but this is not about that this is about isla and it's about <laughs> our industry being more involved in sustainability yeah on a continual basis right and and i want i want to come on to kind of like how isla is going to support the industry going forward um i think three areas i want to really cover off is your training yeah. 
your workshops, which I know are going to be ready by around November time. And then two tools that you guys are working on to help people actually, you know, track, measure and get involved. Because I think that's something everybody loves a tool, right? We're project managers. We love it. We love a tool to to help us kind of track things. So let's talk about the training first. Kind of like what areas of training are Isla going to support freelancers, organizations, whatever kind of adopt? So I think, sorry, just before we jump into what that training is, I think it's sure. quite good to frame all of those different things, those resources that you've just talked about is as some of our core work. So yep. what we want to be doing and want to be achieving. So our kind of our core, our core work is to facilitate, educate and report. Um, and so kind of all educate, facilitate, report, however you want to look at it. So, but from yep. an education perspective, that's where um, our training comes into play. Um, so the training that we've put together is for project project managers, uh, managers, production, producers, uh, anybody who's working in the actual delivery of the event. Um, and it's focused around three core modules. Um, the essentials, which gets you, make sure that you're speaking confidently about sustainability so that when a client says, oh, we want to be zero waste, do you understand truly what that actually means? Or, um, you know, to be able to talk confidently about plastics and single use plastics and understand, you know, what's bad and actually what's good. Um, just, just general um, sustainability uh, essentials that are critical to know so that you can have a genuine and confident conversation. Um, the second module, second core module is around um, identifying sustainability um, performance indicators. So what are your KPIs for this event? Are you looking to be carbon neutral? Are you looking to be single use plastic free? Are you looking to be a plant-based event? All those kinds of things, but understanding mm-hmm. how to set those indicators based on kind of your level of control, your values, um, and you know, what's going to have the biggest impact and all those kinds of things. So it's really looking at, it's like, you know, ultimately the skills give you a 30 minute process that you can go through at the beginning of a project, which you can embed into your pitch or, you know, go through with your client, however you want to do it, but it helps you set those indicators. And then the third module that goes alongside that is kind of once you've got those KPIs, how do you embed them into your project? How do you actually start planning for those from the beginning rather than as afterthoughts? Um, so it's kind of things like if you've got a zero waste um, KPI, how do you actually embed that in part of your design process and then your logistics process, your production process and kind of your your um, live and breakdown? Um, so it's about being able to um, track what you're trying to achieve understand who's responsible how you can do it and then look at your outcomes and be able to report on that post event and you know every you know pretty much every event you do you send a report to a client and some description to say we did this or we did that or this was you know to be able to actually include your successful or unsuccessful outcomes and provide learning and feedback as well and it all kind of loops back in and and the reality is once you start on the whole a lot of the indicators as we learn will be quite similar so it just becomes a part of a repetitive process in the same way that you know when you're putting together a budget as you gain experience you can often just chunk stuff out quite simply and quite easily um yep. and you can guess points and guesstimate certain things because you've got that experience it will be become the same in many ways with sustainability that then once you kind of set those parameters you can start to refine them um and shape them properly and make sure that you're doing the right things so it's, it's giving people a methodology to work towards work with. And the, and the training then is that going to be delivered online or in person how's how can people get involved in the training at the moment, the training is online. Um, we'd love to deliver it in person, but that's just going to be dependent on how things transition over the next sort of six months and so on. But um, yeah, sure. the first core module is included for up to 10 people in the membership fee, um, whether you're a supplier or an agency. Um, and the second and third modules are discounted for members, um, but anyone can buy them, essentially. So just to qualify that then, could can individual freelancers who are looking to upskill or make themselves more valuable to organizations going forward will they be able to also yeah. access the training on an individual basis yeah so we have an em- event professionals membership um, yeah. which includes that first module um within the membership package and obviously once you're a member you get access to the working groups you know the network the resources the toolkits all that kind of thing um, there's a lot there are quite a few things that will just be general access you know as we're a non-profit so there needs to be a degree of uh, being able to make enough for the organization to survive and deliver on its aims but essentially we're not we don't want to hoard knowledge um, yeah. you know we want to make as much as possible available to everybody um where we can um yeah. so that's that's the yeah that's the training 
That's amazing to hear. I think, you know, it's been very apparent recently over the last few months that, that there's been a huge appetite to absorb more training, upskill, you know, both in digital and other elements of, of kind of event produ- production um, or event organising. And it's what I would love to see going forward because once you come out of like event management courses, maybe at universities and stuff, some of the other training that's out there in the industry has to be funded through a company because it's so, you know, so, so cost prohibitive for individuals yeah. to kind of access that unless they, they can do that through a, a larger membership or, or something like that. So it's great to hear that you're, you're doing that. And I guess that takes us nicely on to kind of like the workshop format then. Yeah. So what are the workshops going to format and are they going to work in the same way? Are they going to be online, in person? They're, so the workshops, they're actually working groups rather than workshops. Okay, sorry. So that's all right. Um, the working groups will be, um, are currently only accessible to members um, mm-hmm. rather than general um, event professionals and so on. So essentially the working groups, once you kind of become a member, we take you through kind of an induction process in terms of we ask you to complete a specific survey which helps us understand sustainability knowledge practices if you're an individual it's going to be very different than if you work for an agency or a supplier or if you're a brand or a corporate or so on Um, but essentially that's where we can start gathering knowledge understanding about what are you doing what Mm -hmm. works what experiences Mm -hmm. you have because one of the things is you know Isla isn't existing to say everyone's doing absolutely jack all, you know, there are people who have put some brilliant practices into place. There are some events and organizations and agencies and some of our founding member agencies, you know, have have worked really hard on sustainability policy and approaches and all that kind of thing. Um, And we don't really want to reinvent the wheel. We're not here to be dictatorial. We're here to be collaborative and a network and an organization that helps to um, process a lot of information, create those best practices and guidelines um so i can't actually oh the working groups <laughs> off on one. i don't know what you're asking. um the working groups will basically come from those surveys and consultations through that induction period where mm-hmm. we will understand as a industry what are the biggest challenges and pinch points what do people want specific support with what areas are they regularly asked by clients um and just creating a picture around i think we can probably guess a lot of those will be around like measurement and um you know, sustainable materials and that kind of thing. But what it then does is going to give us a focus. Members are able to join a working group. Mm -hmm. That working group will, um, we're working out as part of the survey, how often people would be able to meet all that kind of stuff. So we're trying to create something that works for people that they can commit to without being a huge commitment, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, And um, basically creating focuses for these groups. So if it is down to sustainable materials, for example, what, how do we take that process through? What do we do about sustainable materials? How do we address this? How can we therefore create either like a supplier network or a supplier database, or I'm just kind of reeling off ideas rather than things that would definitely happen. Or, um, you know, do we have a specific list of materials, all those kinds of things so that we can understand we can cre- basically create a resource that people can use. So at the end of that, you'd kind of finish that working group. Maybe it's a working group that only lasts for like six months, for example, mm-hmm. because it's a very specific element. And then we kind of got something out of that a piece of best practice, a guideline, a toolkit, something along those lines, or, you know, maybe it's a longer term project that is going to be about, I don't, I don't even, I don't even know necessarily, but it could be, you know, the reporting and, and, um, measuring and so on which is always going to be a longer term working group so how can we refine the measurement tools and so on that we've developed which i know you're coming on to next <laughs> I, I love a, i love a good working group though because i think you know with it within anything you know any industry any any subject matter like sustainability there, there are going to be individuals that are just that a little bit more passionate about a certain area right and, and, and something that they're really willing to, to to drive on and spend the extra mm-hmm. amount of time and effort in you know for me it would be technology like how is technology playing a role in sustainability i know for others it would be more around best practice or materials or you know even the training you know how do we continually train mm-hmm. and reinvest in our organizations and our people to, to make sure we're achieving these um, targets and, and, and best practice so I love working groups and I love the idea of having kind of like some smaller sprints and some longer sprints and some, some bigger stuff to work on I think that's a great way for an organization to really pull resources and talent and experience into really focused efforts around around particular yeah. 
particular ideas. So I'm yeah. sure it'll become apparent what those working groups are going to work on um, very, very shortly. But yeah, it's, it's a great yeah. format to work on. Well, exactly. Yeah, we need that to be led by the industry. It's not something mm. that I personally want to, I don't want to dictate what people should be doing, what we should be focusing on. If, you know, that's where the surveys and the induction and the consultation period comes from is to help us centre and focus and understand where we need to go. Um, and mm -hmm. I think that's really one of the things about Isla is that we want to do two things. We want to guide and lead. You know, we want to be leaders. We want to be showing how you can do things properly or not, sorry, not properly, but how you can do things differently, you know, be kind of pushing uh, and leading from the front on, on what we need, kind of pulling people with us. But at the same time, there is a wealth of knowledge and experience. You know, the event industry has just got some brilliant minds, you know, incredible creatives, logistics, you know, um, technologists, you know, yep. production across the board. We've just got brilliant, brilliant brains. So how can we kind of push from behind or lead from behind rather than at the front as well to kind of help shape and, and move that through in a way that is actually beneficial for the people using Isla, using the services, using the resources and so on. Cause it, there's no point in it doing something that isn't useful to people. Yeah. And it's really interesting to say that cause that, that brings me, it reminds me of a point that you, you made prior to us starting recording this podcast, which there is, or has been the statement made that the events industry is the fifth most polluting mm. industry on, on the planet, which I, I sh really struggle to believe based on, you know, the other industries that are out there and manufacturing processes mm. and, and the way that we consume certain things. I guess, are they taking that just because of the, like things like air travel and stuff like that? Have you found anything to back that statement up? Well, I actually, I've looked um, for, for what backs that statement up and I've not been able to find anything that says that we are the fifth most, I haven't been able to find that evidence. Um, mm -hmm. It's interesting you say that because that definitely segues into the next point about measurement is that actually I don't know how anyone can make those claims because we don't measure our industry. The events industry yeah. is, isn't measured and invariably when it is measured, it's guest travel. You know, that's something really easy to capture um, yeah. when it comes down to it. So that's what becomes the measured element. So it well, it could well be the fifth most polluting industry based on air travel only. But I, again, I don't know. And so that's where one of our key things come into is around measurement. Yep. Um, so you, you mentioned it earlier in, in terms of kind of our facilitation, which is kind of the working groups and the network and peer to peer knowledge sharing, the education, which is kind of the training and the guidelines and the best practice resources. And then the reporting is around how we measure and report in our industry performance. Um, so in terms of measurement, we are in the kind of final hurdle of um, uh, developing a measurement tool um, that we want to bring to the industry that is designed specifically for the event sector. Yep. Um, there are some tools out there um, and through, through our research and kind of looking at, you know, again, not wanting to reinvent the wheel. We don't want to create a tool if there's already something brilliant out there. There are, there are tools, um, but nothing that feels like it does enough or goes far enough to give us the measurement points or the reporting elements that we need. So our measurement tool um, is it's an online tool um, and it's kind of being stress tested at the moment and kind of going through those final stages of development. But essentially it captures um, a few different areas from production, uh, which actually looks at your materials. So like how much plywood are you using? How much acrylic, how much MDF, for example, um, and basically creating uh, your emissions data regarding yeah. that. Uh, we'd look at catering. So what are you feeding people? You know, are they primarily red meat dishes or plant-based dishes, for example, and, and therefore being able to create emission data around that. Um, also looking at our graphics footprint. Um, so what are we printing on and how much are we printing? Um, and uh, travel and transportation for your crew, not just your guests. So crew mm. transport, production transport. Um, a few other areas which my mind's gone totally blank now at uh, waste profile sorry so like what are you actually throwing away and that looks at your food as much as it does your materials um, Interesting. and then also your venue or your location <laughs> energy um and basically you can see from that that it's quite comprehensive it covers most areas of event production and the way that we that we are designing it is that pretty much 90 percent of that information already exists somewhere in some spreadsheet or other you know when you when you're building a set you know exactly how many square meters of mm -hmm. mdf you're buying for example because it's on all of your plans the thing then that you just need to put in is put it into this tool which gives you your carbon emissions you know exactly how many beef 
dishes you've ordered, prawn dishes you've ordered, vegetarian dishes you've ordered, it just needs to go into this document. And it's the same thing with, again, with your trucking and your production transport. You know what kind of, what size vehicle is arriving because, you know, you've got it on a uh, trucking schedule somewhere. All you need to know is your start post code and that gives you your mileage, for example. Or, you know, so, so all the information is there. It's just about people taking that next step of putting it into um, a system and why it's in stress tests and so on is just to make that as easy and simple as possible for people to do because we don't have, well, we've got an abundance of time now, but we also don't have time when we're doing these events. So. Well, let me ask you a, a, another question on that then, because, you know, I said this to you before we, again, before we started recording this podcast, that I guess it's really important to make sure that this doesn't sound like one of those things that only the largest of the biggest, that, that've got the most bandwidth or the most resource to throw at something. And, you know, going back to your point about our industry is not measured across the board, not just in sustainability, clearly on economic impact and support and all that kind of stuff. It's a big problem most of the time because it comes down to human resource in order to facilitate that measurement right you know, that tracking and i think it's really important also to stress that the tools between the members because everything is being tracked in the same way there'll be a harmony across the data so there'll be no discrepancies no like oh this system reports in this way and this system yeah. reports in this way and i think it's really important again to say that i guess i'm gonna ask you a question actually I guess, do you see, do you envisage, envision a future where actually the human element is taken out of that? The report is a click of a button, but that's because the information from supplier, venue, ticketing, registration is kind of populated into, so it's coming in centrally through API or something like that, like let's say, and then it's it's just all visible through a dashboard and, and then hit the report and off you go kind of scenario. Because yeah, there's always I mean, that element of human that's error. That's the dream. You know, yeah. The dream is that you would you put in as little information as possible and it does everything for you you know people want those simple systems um so absolutely is that going to be how it works no not straight yep. away that's the reality <laughs> um, <Trap. laughs> but we are looking to just make it as simple as possible you know sure. and the reality one of the things about the way the tool works is that it doesn't have to just be done by one individual you know? mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. the other thing is that suppliers can contribute to that information so as a production nice. company they would contribute their piece of data to that reporting if that's how the agency wanted to do it for example mm -hmm. and as a corporate Again, you know, you might have somebody, a lot of corporates do actually have sustainability leads. So it may well be that that's a piece of work that sits with somebody and they gather all the information and that's their job because they've actually, they've, they've got that in house. Um, what we're trying to do, and again, it's all a learning process. You know, we're not, yeah. we are not, well, I'd love to say that we are the solution for everything. We want to be the solution for everything, but this is a learning curve. We need to know what the industry needs, how it works, how it functions, feedback, testing, you know, um, but essentially, again, it just comes back to um, how can we make this as simple as possible? How do we make this accessible to everybody? You know, as a massive organization working on huge 20,000 person exhibitions at Excel, right down to yeah. a small company that's doing, um, you know, an activation in Victoria Station, for example. Um, how do we make it accessible to everybody and uh, applicable kind of universal and maybe we'll recognize that it won't be necessarily universal in the same way and we might have to have a few different tools this is going off on one i'm not sure i necessarily think that that's a useful thing to be referencing okay um, the tool at the moment the way the tool works is that it's going all the data is collated uh, collected and it's centrally reported anonymously um, nice. okay, yeah. At the moment, that's all back end. That's all with us. You know, all, all an agency or a supplier or a brand would need to do is make sure that, that data is completed to the best of their ability so that we don't have any gaps. But gaps in information are data in themselves. Yep. Um, so that's all something that we would handle. It's all protected, anonymous and so on. But we use that data to produce an industry report. That report shows us our performance. It shows how we're doing compared to other sectors. Um, you know, the festival sector, for example, with sort of Vision 2025 um, and the different things that are happening in, in the festival world, you know, they've made huge advances. Um, they're a lot further on in their journey than the corporate sector and kind of the B2B side of things. So it's about um, where we can, how can we align with them, how can we use their knowledge and their experience to kind of input and build into ours. But at the same time, if they're able to report on what they're doing, we should be able to report on what we're doing as well. And therefore Absolutely. setting yearly targets as a result of that as a result of that information, um, a reduction target. And then again, the information all feeds back in and, and it's all collate, collated centrally. And then we're able to show that, you know, 
year on year, we're reducing by 8% as recommended by the IPCC and so on to reach 50% reduction in emissions by 2030. That's the goal. But, you know, um, we need to make it work for people. It needs to be actionable, but it also needs to be accountable. So, you know, it, I think there's a, there's a psyche change that we need that sustainability isn't a nice to have. Sustainability is essential to, um, to making sure that we have viable life on the planet in 200 yep. years time that kind Absolutely. Of thing. You, know, you can't see it today you won't see it tomorrow but you know if we don't make any changes in 10 15 years time it's going to be a very different space that we are working in and, and as time goes by you know those are those elements are only going to get worse uh so i think yeah so having something that is accessible and accountable and actionable aaa yep there it is yeah I, and I think it's it's really important, isn't it, to to be able as a as a as a company to be able to benchmark yourself against others in order to be able to also move move the bar yourself. Like, yeah. you know, if you're if you're trying to do your own internal audit measurement and all that kind of stuff, without that comparison of of sector or support from an organisation like Isla, it's kind of like licking your finger and putting it in the wind. It's like, what direction am I actually going in? Is is this good? Is this bad? Is this where where are we and then that can become frustrating in terms of continuing to invest in in that right because you don't know where you are well i think that's one of the things because like we've obviously we've spoken a lot with a lot of different people corporates agencies suppliers you know individual professionals our own experiences and so on but i think that's one of the key things is just not having anywhere to compare yourself not being able to benchmark not having the resources that you need to turn mm. to not having the educational support that you might need um having no idea how you compare against somebody else, measuring against different systems, using different kind of carbon emission data, depending on which consultancy you're working with. If you're working with a consultancy, you know, we've spoken to a few people that have tried to do measurement by themselves and, and taken information from the internet and it's just, it's, it's wrong, but they're trying the best that they can. So yeah, it comes back to, um, it comes back to that space of having something centralized, standardized, measurable, methodological yeah um, that that's a big word though yeah, yeah it's, it's kind of like it's all I hate the phrase but singing from the same hymn sheet it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's the only way it's going to work and i think when you look at kind of what the un ipcc which is the um international 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 panel on climate change um you know their their big thing is radical collaboration um they're like you know we need radical radical collaboration cross sector and that's what we are you know that's what they're telling us to do they are the science. They are leading the way. Um, if that's the recommendation, then let's do that. Let's be radically collaborative and let's collaborate across our sector. So yeah. that's really where kind of this core, that's the core of who and what we are. And I mentioned that earlier, and I think it's really important to reiterate this. Our industry supports every other industry out there. We have the ability as an industry to affect change in every other sector out there. Um, whether that be through production impact, education, you know, even event organizers listening to this now, like as part of your education program, at any of your events, you have the ability to weave sustainability through that message because it will be a part of your sector. There's no doubt about that. There is not a part of the, there's not an industry in the world that sustainability shouldn't be a part of the, of the, of the conversation. Mm. So as suppliers to that sector, whether that be agency, supplier, venue, whatever, I think the word is responsible. We are responsible mm. to and to understand what role we play in that yeah. as part of that delivery process. Yeah, it is that responsibility, and I think it's one of those things that, like, once your eyes are open, it's very hard to close them. Yeah, um, you know, sustainability is something that I have kind of centered and focused in my personal life for a long time, just in terms of how I approach certain things, how I choose to live my lifestyle, and. Um, you know, realizing that actually that needs to be transitioned to my working life as well uh, and yeah. taking responsibility and being accountable. And that's so much where this is growing from, but it's partly because my eyes got opened. You know, I, I read the IPCC report um, from, from 2019 and actually that was where it was just like, I can't, I can't ignore it. Um, and I think it's the case with so many different things, you know, whatever your personal cause is, whether it is sustainability, whether it's politics, whether it is I don't know. I don't, I don't know what it is, but yep. you know, once you're aware of something, once you start doing the research into it, it becomes integral to who you are, I think. And that's and, and if we can kind of show that sustainability impacts every single one of us, 
um, you know, you can't you can't close your eyes to it. You've got to do something. I totally agree. I totally agree. And, and, and for those out there that are kind of like, oh, well, it doesn't really have an impact on my life. That's kind of the problem. Like if you're not vi- if you don't understand how it might impact on your life in the future or your children's lives or your family's lives or the legacy that you're leaving for future generations and things like that, like that's part of the problem. It, it, you, you, you know, everybody has a responsibility to open their own eyes. And yes, they will have to make decisions based on their own circumstances. Not everybody can do things like drive electric cars or install solar. You know, people are restricted through their means and and we get that. But at least being aware of it and having some some core values, I think if everybody does that, it it moves us better towards towards a better future. I guess then finally, Anna, where can people find out about Isla? Like where where do we go? How do we sign up? Like what's the next steps? Yeah, so the um, website is weareisla.co.uk and that's I-S-L-A. Um, and uh, get in touch. I'm on LinkedIn. We're on LinkedIn. I'm Anna Abdelnor. I won't spell my name out for you. But um, yeah, just get in touch. Anna at weareisla.co.uk. Um, send an email. Um, tweet us. We are yep. Isla underscore UK. You can, you can reach us all over the place, but um, we are looking to grow our membership network. Um, we've got our 12 founding members. We've got some um, great addi- other agencies and suppliers that are currently in the process of getting involved as well. We're, we're growing. Um, if you're a venue, let's chat. If you're an exhibition organizer, let's talk as well. You know, we're looking to kind of reach the full scope of the industry, venues, exhibition organizers, event professionals, brands, in-house corporate events teams, agencies, suppliers. You know, it is a cross-sector collaborative um, initiative. Awesome, and it is it is so agency though to call it. We are Isla. I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna call you Isla. I, I have to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Anna, thank you very much for coming on today. I'm sure this is not going to be the last time we speak to you about this. I, I'd love to do a regular update, maybe you know every quarter or something, every six months on on this subject matter. It's certainly not something that event industry news is going to be quiet about. Over that, you know, it's part of our core editorial. We we have a guide, hopefully helping people around sustainability. We we have the yeah. Sustainable Event Awards as well, which was our kind of effort to elevate the good work that people are doing and share that, you know, share that information because a lot of that good practice is, is kind of hidden away. Yeah. Um, so I'm sure we'll get you back on maybe when 12 members are 24 members and 24 or 240 and, mm-hmm. and we can and we can really push this. So anybody listening or watching today's podcast, please do get in touch with Anna. Please subscribe to Isla. Just, just, you know, follow them on Twitter, subscribe to the newsletter, get involved. Even if you can't get involved as a member at this stage, I think the information that we're going to see come out from this organization and this cross industry collaboration group is going to be invaluable uh, for our sector. So I I implore you to do that. Um, Anna, thanks for coming on again and we'll catch you in the next one. Thank you so much. It was great to join you.